let's talk about Jack Kirby. Let's just talk about it. Let's talk about yeah. your book. I got a couple questions for you about oh, yeah. that I got written down here. Um, some of the choices that you made here. Mm -hmm. Sure. Particularly character design. This is yeah. my number one question. Jack Kirby looks like no one else in the book. Yeah. Definitely completely like a different species. Sure, yeah. Um, <laughs> almost, right? Like a different in comic style. And honestly, I was expecting that I was going to get this thing and I was going to open it up and it was going to be in this in Kirby style. Right, yeah. And Jack Kirby would look like, uh, you know, Sergeant Fury or something. You well, know? I don't know about that, but I wasn't expecting... <laughs> You know, the big, I, I wasn't expecting the Japanese uh, manga influence that I think I'm seeing here. Tell me about the yeah, character design. Yeah, because, and, yeah it is like, it is like, um, it's, it's not a style that Jack Kirby really ever employed, you know, himself. Uh, and, and it was, it was like, it was a choice. Um, and it was something that sort of came out of just like the process of making this comic because I did start off drawing sort of like a, a more, you know, like a more sort of like semi-realistic Jack Kirby and stuff. And I didn't like, it just wasn't, it wasn't doing it for me and stuff. And and like, I just started toying with different things. And then like, I kind of hit on that. And like the comic like really came alive after that. And it was, and it, it like just made you like, it. you got like just pulled like straight into Kirby, yeah. into yeah. his yeah. world. And, you know, saw the world like through his eyes and, and he did stand out. It wasn't like, okay, now which one of these middle-aged men is Jack Kirby again? Right. That, oh, no, wait, that's Vince Coletta. Okay, yeah. And that, you know, but it was like, okay, there he is. There's the star of the show. And, and it just, you know, again, it's like you just, you make these decisions. You make like a million decisions when you're working on something. And uh, like that, you know, that, that was a pretty bold one. There's, there's probably like a couple like bold like decisions that I made, but I, it, like it, it, you know, it just, you know, made a ton of sense to me on sort of an intuitive level. And then also like on a on kind of like when I like analyzed it, it made sense too. like just sort of him, like, you know, retaining this, like, you know, childlike wonder and this, like, you know, just sort of like openness, like this openness to, um, you know, your own imagination and the collective unconscious, mm -hmm. ah. which going like, it just, it, it, it made like so much sense for, for so many reasons, but yeah, it is, it's not um, it's it's not the obvious choice that's for sure well and plus i think you know reader identification right the the yeah. bite, the big eyes invite sympathy and then the contrast of him to the other characters just makes a laser focus like you're saying it's like obviously this is the guy the main character on every page there's an otherness or an alienness almost to him yeah. which is probably true if you compare his talent that's, and his abilities yeah that's what um that's 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 how Roz kind of described him. That like uh, there was like a UFO cult that came to visit their house, like in like maybe 1970 or something, and like she, Roz felt like you know he was going to go with them, <laughs> like he was going to like go into the mothership, you know, like right. and, you know, and and just him being like, you know, like just kind of like set apart and like where where did all these ideas come from? Like who who are you? Like you know, um, yeah, just. Um, you know, like he, like just kind of giving like a visual to, to sort of like, like, um, you know, like a, like an invisible reality that like Jack Kirby was this sort of like, you know, one, one in a million, once in a lifetime, uh, uh, once in a century talent. I just love, I don't know. I love a good underdog story. I love a good, somebody who stands up to bullies. Like, I love that. And like everything I've ever read about Kirby and everything that you showed in this book is just like, man, that's a, that's just like a guy you could get behind. You know what I mean? Like mm -hmm. he just seems like a really good guy, but tragically lacking in like, like all those amazing abilities. If he couldn't drive a car, for instance, right? Like he was just too out of it. And just like, he was just like, like in his own. yeah, yeah. Um, so what do you think that's, when you because it's hard to overstate right his impact on the art on the art form and and do you think that comes from like i don't know is it a genetic is he a mutant is it like is it or is it or, or is it is it is that something anybody can get to by working hard enough and drawing as many pages as he drew and doing what he did yeah i mean that's that's um that's my understanding of things like i i know 
what I was like as an artist, you know, when I start, like when I, you know, was like, oh, I'd like to be an artist. Like I know what that stuff looked like. I know what I became. So like, I, I do feel like it's within anybody's grasp and it is just, um, and I feel like the science like more and more is sort of supporting that, that it is just a matter of like putting in yeah. the hours. So somebody like Jack Kirby who like, I mean, lived in an age where there weren't, uh, where there wasn't like, uh, you know, he, video games, <laughs> you know, like, like where, where there was, uh, you know, like a lack of like ways to entertain yourself. Right. Uh, you know, so there's that, but then also, uh, you know, sort of grew up with like a, a lot of like trauma, you know, like a lot of like violence in his neighborhood and then, and then going through like World War II. So like that kind of stuff kind of, you know, wound, you know, like, like wound him up, like, like, like set the engine going and, and just like gave him a lot of like incentive to just like sit by himself in a basement at a drawing yeah. board, and get all this stuff out. Like, so, right. but, but it, it did end up being like just the result of like just a tremendous number of hours. And, and he didn't um, like, I had this idea in my head uh, when I first you know started learning about Kirby of like what his process was like. And I pictured it because he produced so much, Oh, you know, uh, work. I assumed that his hand moved really fast. That that he right. would draw. And when I started drawing comic, that's what I tried to do because I imagined, okay, this is what Kirby did. So I would just try to draw really fast. But then, you know, I I you know later on saw like you know videos. Uh, there's only like a couple videos of of, of him drawing uh, that have surfaced, but very slow and deliberate. And, and he's really enjoying his process and noodling and you know have, having some fun and letting the thing go where it's going to go and it, and and the reason why he produced so much stuff is that he would do that for uh you know most of a day every day like he would you know and that's what it was it was just like all those hours staying put at the drawing board that that was was doing it it wasn't any kind of like, right like it's literally boils down to like neural neuron connections that to his nerves in his arm right yeah and but also filtered through not just an imagination because people talk about kirby's great imagination but honestly he talks about it a lot you talk about it in this book he had a lot of influences right he would reach to his like what were my favorite sci-fi stories from the pulps what were these things that i can bring out and and he also had the thing that made those hours happen honestly and the difference i think between say the modern cartoonists and people of that generation is that for him it was like first and foremost it's a job to, and he needs to put, he needs to pay his mortgage, put food on the table and take care of that. I mean, everyone has to do that to some degree, mm -hmm. but it seems to me like more and more artists are, have a more idealistic vision of like their art and the purity of their art and everything else. Um, that he was willing, he had that, but he was willing to sacrifice it because he knew he, he just, he had to get that paycheck. Yeah. I mean, that, like, that's how he would talk about his work, at least. Like he would say that like, oh yeah, you know, there wasn't any artistic pretensions. It was like, yeah, I'm doing this to put food on the table. And, and, and I understand that pressure and like growing yeah. up depression, I'm sure that that was a real thing. But I mean, I, you know, like, it's sort of obvious to me that, that he did love the work. And when he wasn't drawing for his job, uh, his hobby was drawing, you know, for pleasure, right, he, right, he do these things that, that weren't. So I, I mean, I think he I think he really did love it. And, and really did have a lot of those, uh, you know, sort of things that like, you know, like, like we like, like, uh, our generation is sort of, you know, more, more willing to talk about or, or, or better at talking about than he is like, the, the, you know, these like, artistic pretensions, or, you know, whatever you'd want to call it, right, uh, a better uh, word for it. But I think he had those too. It's just like, it was kind of unthinkable for him to like, talk that way like that. That's true. Like, I mean, that generation, yeah, that generation right? Yeah, you'd you get you'd get bounced out of your, out of your neighborhood, you know, talking like that. Well, and more also, like he was just used to like cartoonists work for hire, and you got your thing. And I mean, there were exceptions to that. That was what was very interesting to me, though, is that if Kirby had some of the business sense of some of his contemporaries, like let's compare two different guys. Like you could say Bob Kane, right? Bob Kane, super business savvy, artistically. Mm, but then the ultimate synthesis of both, I I think, is a Will Eisner who takes mm -hmm. the art to the highest level. But then had a studio, knew what he was doing, was running like running things, 
um, like a business, expanding, going into newspapers and other areas that were just, you know, nobody was even thinking about trying military stuff, all that stuff. Um, I, I found that I wished, I just wished that Jack either knew somebody like that or just had a little bit more of that because I, I think we would have seen, he would have had more. I think he did have some of that. And um, it's just like this, like incredibly hostile environment. Like it's, it, it's, um, you know, just like comics in that era was like really tough. And, and he did like, like you, you could say that like, you know, Joe Simon was more of the business guy in the Simon and Kirby, Kirby partnership but you know jack was like making moves too like he was making moves you know trying to get tv shows made and think you know and, and trying to get syndicated comics going like he did try a lot of things it's just, and and he put in uh years and decades of that kind of stuff and and just came to sort of like a, a dead end you know like like he put like decades into into that kind of stuff and came to this like dead end in like the late 50s uh into like you know 19 you know the early 60s I was just like, man, like, I'm like, the, the, you know, comics, like, I'm this close to quitting comics and, and comics is this close to quitting me. And, uh, and like, really all like, I know I'm good at it. And I can do it. And like, let me just do some comics. And then, you know, and then the Marvel thing, like him and, and Stan Lee kind of met at like the exact perfect time, like where they were both incredibly desperate, and both had like logged an incredibly long uh, number of hours and years of working in this medium and, and like they had this sort of desperation but also kind of like almost like a, I don't even care anymore attitude which was yeah. kind of like the perfect uh, alchemy to like create something incredible nothing to lose right so yeah. why not try something new I think that's that's really true I want to talk let's start you talking about Stanley let's talk about Stanley and your book yeah. I love you know this is post transformation i guess into swing and smile and stan but he starts off as kind of stanley right tell, tell us about because honestly there's a point at one point where i go was that stan lee that he talks to i think it was the first page and it's just sort of like there's a guy he's calling stanley and it's never explicitly like called out exactly who that is mm -hmm. but then that guy starts a transformation in this book and turns into a, what he does so tell me your take on it and let's put to rest let's Let's answer the question of who was the real creator yeah. of, the, uh, of these books. I mean, I, like I, I, I mean, I, I feel like Jack Kirby was the driving force. I think, I think Stan Lee, like I think it was a collaboration. Um, I, I think Stan brought some important ingredients to it, like, and, and not just like because some people will say like, oh yeah, you know, great, great editor or great um, hype man or whatever. Hype man, yeah. unparalleled yeah. hype man, yeah. right? That's his true brought, calling. That's, but I yeah. think he also brought like real, like genuine uh, creative, you know, things to it. I just think that like Jack Kirby's, like what Jack Kirby brought like dwarfs that, you know, dwarfs what what um, what Stan brought. But again, like that's my personal opinion. I think I agree, but the synthesis ultimately is worth more. Like, I don't think he could have done it. I don't know what other writer would it I, it's impossible to say i guess it, but we've it, seen yeah. kirby with other writers and we saw him writing himself and he they never quite got that magic that was in yeah. my opinion yeah like um you, you'd have to do like an experiment where you could like like view alternate universes and yeah right one uh uh you know one variable or whatever and see what happens like because it is kind of like okay i see uh the, the challenge is the unknown and it's like it's like this close to being the Fantastic Four, right. but like, yes, but it's not. It's not, and like the Fantastic Four, Fantastic Four number one is magic in a way that Challengers of the Unknown is not. Even as close right. as it's close, but like there's this like magic element that is missing. Now maybe if it like Jack Kirby created uh, Challengers of the Unknown at DC, a very restrictive editorial environment. Maybe if like Jack Kirby was like self-publishing or what like how to, could do maybe he maybe he wanted to make a book length story that had a little more personality had some funkier looking you know the thing kind of character like maybe but we don't know we know what this yeah, thing right. is and and yeah there are like parts of it that like seem to me are you know like you know you know i see stanley's fingerprints on it. it's just it's just like yeah just for my money it's like um you know you it it's it's just so much Jack and and just um, 
you know, just for the longest time, these things were viewed as purely Stan Lee creation. Right, yeah, right. Stan would cre- he would credit the artist and say how how important the artists were and all this and that. But when when it came down to brass tacks, if you would press him to it and say, well, who created the Fantastic Four? He would say, I created the Fantastic Four. I came up with all this stuff, and then Jack was the perfect guy to draw it. But yeah. like I cre- like like he had just a very different philosophy of what creation is and that was sort of the dominant narrative for uh you know the you know for for most of most of of, you know the history of these things and and um just you know so it it really needed a a corrective the 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 only question is like the degree of the corrective um so but i would i would say you know jack kirby is um at least 50 percent responsible for creating these things uh Possibly, in my opinion, m- much more, but but at least it's yeah. 50%. I very at the very well. I think it's easy. I when I started thinking about it real hard, and I said, "Look, we could debate like could another writer have come in with Jack and made that pretty good, like knowing what how much Jack did as far as layouts and yeah. stories and everything else." And you could go, "Yeah, per, maybe I could see it, maybe." But you go, "Could we have brought in a contemporary another of Jack's contemporaries and replaced right. him and?" Come up, impossible right it never would have happened so that says everything to me yeah yeah it's i mean it's Um, one of those things you could like endlessly debate and and i enjoy endlessly debating but yeah we'll just never know so i just kind of i try eh. to put it out like be as fair as possible to to you know both parties and 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 uh, and you know the, the the fact that like we'll never ultimately know but also this you know it's it's I'm telling Jack's story. I gave, I, I let Stan sort of give, tell, tell his piece and stuff, but this is, this is Jack's story. So, you know, we're hearing, uh, you know, from, I found it interesting that he was not really able to get the respect in comics that he does absolutely deserved and should have got. But like when he was brought to the animation industry, those people recognized right away and they knew that what they had there and like, let's just let this guy's imagination go loose. And, I had no idea Turbo Teen was a Jack Kirby creation. That was my that was my number one fa- new fact takeaway out of this book for sure. Yeah, like I love that era of because that's my era of Kirby. My first experience of Kirby was through these uh, cartoons that he worked on. Like Thunder, Thunder the Barbarian was like me. I grew up with all that stuff, so that was my first exposure to to Jack Kirby. Um. And then, and then uh, a little bit later was like uh, the Super Powers team, the Super Friends, and like Jack oh, Kirby yeah. didn't work on those particular cartoons, uh, but it was all you know these Jack Kirby. It, it was yes. you know, stuff they grabbed from the com like there's stuff straight out of the Jack Kirby comics that, that that they put in there. So that was another like big exposure to Kirby. Again, like I was not aware of who Jack Kirby was, but I knew that this stuff was like amazing, yeah. very yeah. different from the super friends that I'd, I'd been seeing, you it, know. Exactly. I remember when like dark side and all these, like, who are these guys? I had never heard of those guys when those cartoons came on. Yeah. I mean, I was avidly watching it Saturday morning. That was, I was away and it was, and firestorm too being brought in, I think around that same time. And yeah. they just, they really decided to let loose and go like, let's take these Kirby things that we left in the dustbin. And we really, we really messed up. Yeah in in canceling his books they just didn't appreciate him at career. What, what what do you think is the reason behind that yeah that was a new regime uh you know the old regime at bc was that the people who did cancel the new like you know carmine and you know like and the people who did cancel um the new gods weren't you know like they weren't running the show anymore it was a new it was you know uh jeanette khan and paul levitt and these were people who were like hey you know this stuff jack did was like amazing what 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 the hell and and let's bring this back, you know, prontissimo. And, and then they did um, figure out a way to get Jack, um, you know, like royalties and like profit participation in these things. Yeah. yeah. Uh, and, and the kind of deals that they, they were cutting with, uh, you know, creators who were creating like new things in the 80s. They were gave him sort of a backwards uh, deal for stuff in the 70s. Um, uh, and, and, and the, and the way they were able to sort of like justify it to to corporate or whatever was um, they had Jack uh, do designs for the, the superpowers toy line. He was going to he designed like a bunch of like super cool, uh, 
you know, dark side toys and play sets. Yeah. Like that, some of which did, you know, come into existence, but that, that was how they were able to justify this, this uh, giving him royalties for, for, uh, you know, the new gods and, and, and stuff like that, which like up to, uh, you know, at, at that point, Marvel had done, you know, nothing like that, you know, for, so, you know, the, well, yeah. let's just talk a bit about, man, the original art fiasco and just the idea that, I mean, back then you could buy a Kirby page for what seemed like a lot of money then, I guess. But now we're talking about a single Kirby splash page could go for a quarter million dollars or more. Yeah. I mean, it's amazing seeing like that, that trajectory it went on because it is like, um, you know, like I sort of became aware of, you know, Kirby, like original art in like the nineties and it had appreciated, to, you know, it, it, you know, went from being like, yeah, like 30 bucks or 50 bucks for a page to like, you know, a few hundred, you know, for a page and stuff. But yeah, then it, it just like, you know, you keep adding zeros. Uh, okay. and, you know. Well, Jim Rugg, I think was telling me, I think it was him when I interviewed him here, um, that, uh, you know, there's just portfolio managers that are now that are taking like it's seen as a, a a goal a rock solid investment for the investor class that honestly they're not a collector they don't care they don't they'll never touch it might not even see it it's a portfolio manager who's buying and selling these things in auctions and dealing amongst themselves with them mm -hmm. yeah which is a little bit sad a little bit sad to me but i guess it speaks to the recognition of the 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 the, the high quality of the of the pieces mm -hmm. yeah do you have any original art uh kirby artwork uh no i mean i i i wish you know it it you know i just like i remember being you know like you know 21 or whatever and, and seeing these ads where like you know Roz kirby was was still alive at this time and she was selling and, and you could get like a whole issue of the new gods original art for like five thousand dollars i thought oh man that would be you know and and if i had the foresight it's like yeah five thousand that like that was a lot that was like i mean it may as well have been like five million dollars to me at that point but it's like yeah, and probably and might very well be today five oh sure yeah sure or in the not too distant future especially a complete issue if you had the cover and everything imagine like that's yeah. no that's and cold. you look you look like um you know it would like because i i'd go to comic conventions and i just like look through those like big binders that that original art dealers would bring where you'd see like and, and look through the kirby section just like oh my and you'd see like okay the the um stuff from the 60s is like that's one price tier like an insane price tier but then you'd get into the 70s and it's like okay this stuff not not quite as much but then like yeah the 70s stuff and, the, and then the 80s stuff forget about like 80s stuff was like you could you could get a, a, a like a, a superpowers page or something for like 90 bucks or something but then it's like the '70s stuff bumped up, and then and then now the '80s stuff hasn't bumped up. So it's of like, of course, of course, I would love to have any piece of it, but uh, I don't know. I think I'd yeah. rather have my kid go to college. I, sure, I think yeah. I'm gonna make that choice. Live. And, you know. <laughs> so so tell me, what was your um? Give me your biggest takeaway uh, from from working on this book. This is your first nonfiction work. Yeah. Yeah, what do you like that? I mean, you came out the same week. I got in the mail. I got this book and I got Paying the Land, Joe Sacco's new book. Yeah. Have you read? How did you? Are you? Are you a fan? Yeah. Okay, uh, fan, I know his work. Yeah. I had a big choice on my head. I had both. They're about the same size, similar heft. Mm -hmm. Very interesting work. I had to pick which one I was going to read first. I read Sacco's first. I'm sorry. Okay. Yeah, I, I forgive you. Um. But man, it was awesome. And this was awesome too, though. I, I just thought as an object, it's a beautiful thing. I love the I love I'm really happy with how like I'm very particular about how how, you know, like like the actual like you know, book itself and paper stock, and I was just, you know, blown away. Oh, it's beautiful. It feels good. Mm -hmm. Got a good smell. Yeah. Tastes okay. <laughs> um, tell me about 10 speed press. I, I don't know. Are, are they? Uh, do they publish a lot of comics? I don't know that I've ever I mean, read any. It, they've been around a long time. They've been around since like the seventies, and um, I've heard. I've definitely heard of them, but not as a comics publisher. So how did you get to them? How does that even work? Do you have an agent? How does that work? Yeah, I, I do have an agent. It was like a couple 
like a couple of years prior to this project, they did start, you know, going into comics and, you know, graphic novel publishing. Like, so they had- Like been, everybody else, right? Like everybody else, exactly. Like they had been doing, doing and like largely like, you know, nonfiction stuff. And, and their, their, their lines only expanded since then. Like now they're like really like fully, you know, they, they, they have a, a much wider range of, of projects, like upcoming projects and, and you know, current projects. Um, but yeah, like um, it was, you know, I, this was, this was the first project I did where I, you know, got an agent. It, it just like that. It's just a di like when you're doing like a nonfiction thing, it's just a different category. Like, um, you know, everything I'd done prior was sort of within that like comic book wor the world, which just, just from its history and so it was just like, you know, more informal and you can just kind of like talk to somebody directly and get things done. Yeah, but right. for this, you know, kind of world of, of like, you know, book publishing, uh, you need an agent, like they're, you know, they're Liter not, literary they're, agent, right? Yeah. yeah. Literary agent. Yeah. They're not going to talk, they, you know, so it, I mean, it's, it's a necessity. So I made sure, like, I, I took that step. Um, and then, you know, it's my first time using an agent and and like, I totally see the value of an agent and, and what that, you know, what yeah. that brings and what that does. Like, I totally get it. Uh, but it, it was a necessity and, and, um, and yeah, and, and he, you know, talked to, to different, uh, the, my agent, he, like he talked to different people and, 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 uh, 10 speed just, you know, had, you know, they, 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 they were all in, like they, they really, you know, they, they, you know, were really into this project and really saw the potential of it and were really excited to work with. And it just, and, and, um, you know, they had, you know, the resources to yeah. get Jack Kirby's story out to, you know, a, a mass audience.